the reality of BC's small open trading e economy uh, is such that our, our GDP, uh, uh, believe it or not, is smaller than that of, of the greater Houston, Texas. Um, as a result, the externalities that we deal with uh, whether they be uh, uh, trade barriers or they be uh, price setting or price taking, if you like. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, uh, or the like. But some of the externalities really make us vulnerable to outside control, and, and uh, uh, we've got to find a way to maximize some of the advantages. So, what we've really done here is indicate that while BC has done tolerably well, I think, over the years competitively. Uh, we, though, continue to underperform on many um, criteria uh, against our peer jurisdictions. What kind of building blocks, perhaps, do we need to create to uh, uh, focus on creating prosperity? And not only creating prosperity, but finding a way to share that prosperity. And I don't mean taking from the rich the Robin Hood thing, giving it to the poor, or that sort of thing. I just mean involvement uh, by more people in wealth creation. Because there's a growing sentiment among British Columbians that the success and the growth of business does not improve the social or economic prosperity of our communities or our citizens. I think we're seeing a lot of that translated in this 1% notion that started in the U.S. and got found its way into Canadian cities. And so last fall, along with the Business Council, we launched this thing that I've mentioned that we called the Agenda for Shared Prosperity. What is it? Well, it's a joint initiative with the goals of reconnecting British Columbians and BC communities with the link that does exist between economic prosperity and personal family prosperity. Today's challenge for business is therefore not only to support sustainable policies that have helped us grow and develop the province, but also those that will help restore a stronger sense of prosperity or the shared prosperity. We seem to have a ready fire aim philosophy in many respects, uh, with investment opportunities that come at us, uh, largely driven, I think, these days by transportation and energy-related policies. Um, we seem to forget, I think, the value that we all seem to place on legacy projects such as the Bennett Dams and other things that predate many of us in this room, not all of us. But uh, these are things that are in place that are contributing uh, to the economic well-being of British Columbians. Uh, and uh, the time has come for, in many cases, places like Site C, uh, for them to be replaced or upgraded. So unfortunately, the opportunity to develop shared prosperity is often positioned here in BC as a bit of a contradiction. Uh, regardless of merit, uh, it seems that there's always a group, a significant group, that will oppose anything and everything. I think one of the biggest problems we've probably got as a society is this notion of, of uh, social license that seems to be out there as something that everybody has to acquire before you can take a deep breath. And I, I, I've had somebody said to me, well, you have to get that in line, you have to line up in the NIMBY line to get that. Uh, where do you go to get a social license? Uh, this seems to be the problem that the people in the north have with the pipeline. Uh, they didn't take that into account and they just seem to be floundering as a result because uh, it's being pushed back at them in many ways, in many unrealistic ways perhaps as well. Public dialogue on issues of importance to British Columbians has become therefore very polarized, often based on incomplete facts or understanding and divisive, us versus them, or yes versus no. And when I travel in the north, I can tell you it's north and south. Um, communities in the north see, feel that in these days, they're the ones who are creating the wealth for British Columbians. And uh, you people here in the South uh, are actually spending it. And they point to the Portman Bridge as an example of that. So it's a, and soon the tunnel, maybe. It's a, any, in any event, uh, we want to transcend these differences and we want to work to set a new tone for the conversation about economic opportunities in British Columbia, create what is in effect create a common fact base so that we can have a discussion based on some sense of reality? And so as part of this initiative, we've brought together <clears throat> a group of well-respected British Columbians to form our advisory council. So it's not just a business group talking to another business group about business-related issues. This is uh, 
designed to be apolitical or unpolitical. Uh, there is no government involvement in any shape or form of this uh, at the moment, although leaders of both parties uh, here in BC are firmly aware of it and are being kept involved and, and apprised of our activity. <coughs> but this uh, advisory council, this includes leaders from labor, from the academic communities, First Nations, in fact, Kim Baird, Twaston Chief, ex-chief, soon to be chief, something um, <laughs> is, is a member of this, uh, this uh, group. Former finance ministers from both sides of the house, Andrew Petter and Carol Taylor, you may remember those names. Business leaders and community leaders that include the CEOs of both the YMCA and the YWCA, so some element of social policy involved in here. And to date, we've held nine consultation meetings uh, in the communities around the province. Uh, talking to over 250 people about this agenda and about uh, uh, their perceptions of some of the realities that we have to face. And these workshops have gathered feedback from these communities about what is working, what needs to be improved upon, what will contribute to building a strong local economy that will support its citizens. We're also holding a summit here in Vancouver, well, there in Vancouver, but in the Vancouver area on April the 5th. And this will bring together all those 250 people that we've talked to already, plus a number of uh, cross-section of, of society. We think you know, somewhere between seven and 800 people will be there. And we'll explore the global and national factors and opportunities which relate to our province's economy and our ability to build economic prosperity for uh, British Columbia. One of the keynote speakers is a man called uh, Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. And he'll be joined by David Dodge, uh, former Bank of Canada governor, soon perhaps the only one left in Canada. Um, Christina Romer, uh, former economic advisor to the president in the US, uh, who now works at the U University of California, Berkeley. So we hope to have many of uh, over 250 participants that are part of those regional consultations as a result. At the summit, we're gonna highlight businesses across the province and their contributions um, to local economies and to their local communities. We're gonna take some of the very successful businesses in communities around the province, put the, give them a table at this summit and uh, provide them some seats at those tables so they can bring people from their communities who aren't in that business but are beneficiaries of some of the impact that business investment has had. There is no political involvement. Uh, this April the 5th date will be the last uh, event as part of our process until after the election and in June we will reconvene with more of our, our process. Uh, we believe that a healthy economy maximizes our strategic advantages and that assets in order, uh, in order to sustain a quality of life most British Columbians envision for themselves and certainly for future generations. Yeah.